I've been uh, at Michigan since uh, 2006, and uh, uh, I'm grateful for the legacy that uh, Girard has established in Michigan. He, um, it's uh, even though we didn't overlap, um, he's uh, uh, the evidence of what he's how what he's uh, uh, set up there is uh, is was quite impressive, and still the the high field uh, science um, facilities that he started, uh, Hercules and Lambda Cube and the and the, and the T-cube laser systems are still working and producing science, and uh, um, uh, and it's uh, uh, still a great place to work, and uh, 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 largely because of, of what uh, uh, Girard has established there. And so uh, the little this afternoon, what we're uh, doing is kind of moving on to uh, high field science and um, extreme light, and. Uh, Fortunately, we've got uh, many of the world leaders in high field science and out of second physics um, here this afternoon to give uh, presentations. And so uh, I'll just uh, briefly introduce our first speaker, <coughs> Paul Corkum from uh, NRC in Canada, uh, another Canadian. I'm Canadian as well, so there's a, um, a good uh, contingent of ca Canadians here. And, uh, and from the University of Ottawa. And uh, he will, uh, one of the pioneers of out of second science and he'll uh, he'll give us a uh, overview of, of his of his recent work. Just make sure I can make other places. So it's a great honor to be here in this uh, occasion. I'm not a student of Girard's. I'm a contemporary of Gerard's, really, more or less, give or take a year or so. Um, but uh, slightly different than Gerard, I didn't start my PhD in it, so I didn't start in 1968. Uh, I did my PhD in theory, and then I eventually came to NRC and began to work in lasers, and I think I published my first paper on short pulses in 1982. Um, so that allowed me, in a way, to be sort of a little bit like his students. I got to know his students, many of them, as they were students, and uh, I sort of felt them a bit like my contemporaries. I was older than they, but Wayne and many other people from his group. So I could sort of interact with Gerard as a contemporary, too. I could sort of fit in the middle, and that's how it was for me. And, uh, of course, I was influenced by all of these many ideas coming out of Rochester and then out of Michigan. I don't have great stories to tell of Gerard because I didn't, as I say, know him in that detailed way to have all these funny stories that people have told this morning. So I thought what I would try to do today is to follow an intellectual idea that in some sense Gerard and I have talked about a little bit here and there, and I wanted to just follow it. I only have 20 minutes, so it'll be quite a short, uh, but maybe it just introduces and begins the conversation between us. Now, I work with making very short pulses, and probably everyone that knows me has seen this figure, but I wanted to start out with it just to begin to set the stage. Um, so this is one of these intense laser pulses that we're talking about. In my laboratory, they're not intense as they would be in Girard's. And an atom is placed in this laser pulse, and the laser pulse gets intense enough to ionize that atom, and the ionization occurs more or less right there at the peak. So, at a second science, the part, an area in which I work, begins right here with the removal of the electron when the field is very close to the peak. And that electron in the intensity of the lasers that I work with, 10 to the 14 or 15, moves away from the atom as illustrated and then with its momentum moves uphill, but eventually it comes back and collides with the ion from which it left. In that collision, we do a form of correlated collision physics, which is what I want to focus in slightly here, only slightly, but intellectually or thought, thought about a correlated collision physics. And of course, it's a new form of nonlinear optics. And it's the source of out of second pulses, but only peripherally will I be mentioning that. I'll, I'll use an example from out of second science 
in this example. So let me show you, let me just make sure that you understand the collision. When this electron comes back, it can come back with energy enough to have sufficient energy to knock another one free. Just play pool with another electron inside the system. And in my laser fields there, maybe the electrons come back with a few hundred electron volts. In the fields that Gerard talks about, that electron could come back with a few million electron volts. Okay, so that's the collision physics aspect. The light aspect or the attosecond aspect is when the electron comes back, it could recollide and recombine to the atom from which it left, returning that few hundred electron volts to a photon, and that photon energy could vary depending on the moments of collision and recollision. Uh, re and so attosecond pulses are made from this radiation that's perfectly organized and perfectly synchronized and covers a huge spectral region. So I would say always pushing the limits. Gerard might say about the collision part, hmm, man, that's kind of interesting, Paul, but maybe not too much. What would happen at 10 to the 26 watts per square centimeter? And he would go on and he'd say, being very perceptive, he would say, remember the photon momentum. There's a lot of momentum in these photons at 10 to the 26 watts per square centimeter. So that's what I want to talk about first, the effects of the momentum on the, on the electron and on that collision. So in some ways, we know what happens to the energy. The energy from the photons is split. There's going to be a lot of photons absorbed. Let's say it's n. So the energy is n times h bar omega. And those photon energy is going to be transformed into the ionization potential because you've got to overcome that. It's got to give you the electron kinetic energy that we're going to measure at the end of the experiment. And if the electron remains in the laser field during the whole experiment, some of that energy is tied up in the wiggling energy. It's still taken from the photon, so it's tied up in the wiggling energy. But actually, we know what happens to that energy. It's re-emitted to the light in a shift of color of all the rest of the photons afterwards. So these are the things. And well, it would be nice to measure what really happens to the electron that's created in here. Actually, I wanted to show you the image first of how I'm going to do an experiment, just so you understand what I'm going to show you next. A beam is coming in like this to a jet of gas coming like that, and the light is circularly polarized in the center. And we're going to measure on a detector up here the full three-dimensional momentum of the electron that's created in the circularly polarized beam. In fact, there's the measurement in three dimensions for this beam. It's not so intense here, but it'll tell us the basic physics of the process. In this direction is the direction of the laser polarization. Remember, it's circularly polarized, so it looks like a ring. And in the other direction, the third direction, which is shown by the, more or less the color coding and things like that, you can see it's a three-dimensional picture is the momentum of the electron as it's transferred into the electron along the direction of the electron propagation. Okay, so I want to look at that a little more carefully. So here is that projection. The donut was this way. Look at it sideways. And there's the sideways view of that donut. You're looking right along the width of the donut. There's a hole in the center, but it's obscured by the edges of the donut. If you look at that distribution, here is the energy absorbed or the electric field. It's really closely related to the electric field. If we measure that, we know the energy absorbed or the electric field. And here is that momentum in the direction of the photon propagation. In fact, um, you can study this with, but it turns out if you do the experiment, maybe not carefully, if some contaminant in, there are always some Rydberg electrons, and they provide a nice zero, a nice coordinate system against which to measure. So we can look at the electrons and look at how they move relative to that 
zero that you can see right there. So here is such a measurement. This is the momentum of the electrons in the direction of propagation of the light. It has to be given to it by the photons. Here is the average intensity of ionization. Here it's closely related to the energy of number of photons absorbed. And here is how the scaling goes for two different gases, neon and argon gas at 800 nanometers and 1400 nanometers. That's quite a very different slope here. There's two interesting things on this curve. One interesting thing is that the electrons pick up moment momentum that depends on the intensity of light or the number of photons absorbed. In fact, you can see that the line here is going up with the number of photons absor absor absorbed. However, it's offset, it goes right down and projects to the origin, which tells us that the number of photons that was required for the ionization potential was also taken from the beam and removed from the beam. So actually, we know what happened to the momentum of the photons. The UP over C went back to the field. I already discussed it. The ionization potential over C is given to the ion, and the momentum that we measure here over C goes to the electrons or to whatever else. Interestingly, Gerard, I don't know if you would know it or not. I did not know this, but the forward motion was not surprising. But interestingly, this is very different from what would happen in single photon ionization. There, the electron actually goes opposite direction to the momentum of the photons by, by a, a strange fraction, in fact. That comes from the interaction of the I, I electron with the Coulomb potential during the ionization process. So going back to this figure, well, um, correlated collisions are possible up until this momentum gets too great, but eventually, this electron sees this huge wind blowing it forward, the momentum of the photons. And, well, it probably would not, or it seems like it would not work at 10 to the 26 watts per square centimeter. So Gerard, in my hypothetical question for him, would have been exactly right. What happens at 10 to the 26 turned off long before it. But there's a way around this, an interesting way around this, and I just want to mention it before I go on to the next part and then propose a way to do high intensity measurement. Uh, the momentum shift can be overcome if we take light propagating in two different directions. The momentum of this light and the momentum of this light would cancel out. Now, if it's just ordinary linearly polarized light, it's not so interesting. It only cancels out here and there. In some places it goes one way, in some places it goes another. But if you take circularly polarized light of the same handedness, then it cancels out everywhere, everywhere in space. Think of circularly polarized light counterpropagating the same handedness. The electric fields are adding in this direction, and the magnetic fields are adding in the same direction. The electric and magnetic fields are parallel with circularly polarized light going in the same direction. The electron, therefore, does not move forward. The photon momentum is, is canceled one with the other throughout the whole focus of the laser beam. And so it should be possible to extend collisions not, up, not only up to 10 to the 17, but 10 to the 18, 10 to the 19, 10 to the 26, I believe. So 100 MeV recollisions should become possible, but is this interesting? Well, let's go back to Girard again. Um, these days, whenever I meet Girard, he argues, high intensity implies faster measurement. Does it not, Paul? He would always say. And I always agree to with him. To me, extreme time resolution is really the reason why recollision is really so interesting. Really, this is out of seconds. It's and maybe much faster. I mean, that's the point, is how much faster? How much faster can we go? So I want to now say at a second measurement suggest two approaches and maybe a much more general, a general approach for this high intensity time resolved measurements. 
One of the things that comes from out of second measurements that people use all the time is squeaking, using an external field that's relatively weak to put a mark on a photoelectron that's created. Another one is in situ measurement. I'm actually going, I only have 20 minutes, so I'm only going to focus on one of these and only a little bit on it, but I want to make that general point that there is a general approach to very fast measurements in strong fields. So let's go back to that image that I gave you in the very beginning. I'm going to give you a quantum mechanical version because that's what's really behind what I'm going to show you here, but the essence of what I'm going to talk about does not require quantum mechanics. So in the experiment that I showed you, or in the way I introduced in the first place with a laser field and electron tunneling and coming back and re-colliding, I had drawn classical electrons. The quantum mechanical way is to think of an electron wave packet, not a little particle. Electron wave function, the field makes the electron tunnel, creating a wave packet in the continuum two parts of the same one wave function, one part in the continuum, one part remaining on the atom. Of course, we said that the electron wave packet or the electron is moved by the field like a cork and a water wave up and back down again, but it's a wave packet or portions of the wave packet move like the cork and the water wave. And they wash back and overlap the atoms from which they left. In which case, Two parts of the wave function overlap, they interfere. We have created an interferometer just like we create in light. We create an electron, an interferometer from the atom's own electrons. Isn't that interesting? It's an interferometer in which we can control the interferometer just as well as we control an optical interferometer. For example, in an optical interferometer, there's one part, there's the other part. I would have some sort of delay line, which you can see it. I move a little micrometer back and forth and I would move the delay line over a fraction of a wavelength and I would change the interference effect. But I can do the same thing here. I can add, for example, a second color to the fundamental just weakly because the field, the electron's gone over a long trajectory. And that will add, if the phase is right, doing a little more work on the electron and add to the phase of the electron or if it's a different phase, it will subtract. It's like taking my micrometer and moving it back and forth. So a second field parallel will be like moving the arms or moving the arm of one arm versus, an, uh, versus another. Of course, we can do many other things. We can add a second color at another angle and bring the electron in. It's a sheared interferometer. In space, it's a sheared interferometer in time. And you all know that with an interferometer, we can measure almost everything about light. So we can measure almost everything about this electron that's created from this at a second process. I want to show you an experiment and how this is used, because I wanted to use this as an illustration. But I'm going to come back to the general point in just a moment. In such an experiment, we use a fundamental pulse. It's an 800 nanometer pulse whose polarization changes from circular through linear. I don't know if that's clear right here. This is a linear portion and back to circular. It's an easy thing to make. It sounds complicated, but it's easy to make. And if you just accept that it's easy to make, well. And only when you have near linearly polarized light does this electron come up and re-collide. That's why we do it that way. So here's an illustration of the electron that comes out and re-collides in the top part of the focus, in the middle part of the focus, in the bottom part of the focus. You can concentrate on the red for a moment because that's what the red pulse does. You might say, well, isn't it funny that the trajectory that this electron takes is different in the center than on the edge? But that's because the laser intensity is lower in the edge. In order to get the same color, you need a slightly different motion of the electron. That's really why, the, why they're different. Now, by adding another beam, that comes in at an angle, a small angle in this case, and a second harmonic in this case, a second harmonic beam, we can actually perturb, moving that interferometer, but we move it slightly differently at the top than at the bottom of the image. 
and that's because the angles are not quite the same. And so whatever phase it has in the center, it's going to be a little more because of the different propagation angle or a little less on the top and the bottom. So we place a different trajectory and those are illustrated in blue, just as an illustration. The intensity in this blue pulse can be very weak. In the experiment I'm showing you here, it's on the order of 10 to the minus three in the fundamental. And if it were longer wavelength or higher intensity, it'd be much less. I don't know if you can see at my angle, I can't really tell, but there's a very big difference in this spatial distribution of the pattern that's created in the far field because of that phase shear I've placed on this interferometer. I've taken the wave front and moved it off to the side because I've added phase here and subtracted phase here. And for other phase delays between the fundamental and second, I keep doing that. So you can see I'm gonna wiggle the beam and it goes back there on the screen and it hits there or there, there or up. Moving it up and down, sliding it up and down, giving us information on it. So this is shown here in the spatial distribution in vertical plane and the frequency in the horizontal plane. We don't see a spectrograph here, but we just keep it out for comp to keep it simple. We have a grading in between. So that information is sufficient to tell us about the time structure of this at a second pulse. So the two omega create a spatially dependent phase modulation. I talked to you about it. It's like a phase gate for all of you people. Almost everybody here probably knows frog. It's a short pulse audience. A frog algorithm allows us to fully reconstruct the spatial properties of the beam. At every frequency, there is one at 46, there is one at 79, but you saw we have these at every frequency. I showed you at two time delays, but we have them at all time delays. It allows us to construct the spatial structure fully, reconstruct it inside the medium in which it's created. In other words, we watch the burst inside the medium in its spatial structure. In fact, I won't be able to explain it well to you here, the phase dependence of this displacement, which is different for each frequency, allows us to tell about the spectral phase or the time structure of the pulse. So we have space-time information, full information on this pulse reconstructed in the medium. Here's what the pulse looks like. There's all kinds of ways you can look at it. When you have all information on a pulse, you can propagate it to the far field, which is over here, or the near field, which is over here, right inside the medium as it's created. We can look at its temporal structure. We can look at it, what it looks like in space. We have frequency information. We have everything. I don't mean to talk too long about what the pulse means, what looks like. I just want to say that we can reconstruct this strong field process in the medium. I think this is a general process. I don't think it's, I don't think it's specific to this. I think it's a highly general process. Strong field processes are hardly modified by the presence of a weak field. Yet the weak field in can imprint an indelible mark on the system. I showed you one way in which it's imprinted a delible mark in space. But there are other ways that it can imprint a delible mark. And it need not be in optics. This can also be done in a collision process where you're looking at the electron. We not only measure the at a second pulse in the process I showed you, oh, this allows measurement, this indelible mark. In our case, we not only measure the at a second pulse in space time, but we also measure the time dependence of the perturbing field in an all optical process. So um, we are, I believe this is a general statement. I don't work on 10, at 10 to the 26 watts per square centimeter. I work at 10 to the 14, 15 or lower. But we're trying to use this. This marks the 14, uh, the 50th anniversary of Keldish's. I think almost everybody in the audience that's related to Gerard will know of this Keldish paper, paper on multi-photon ionization. Keldish treated atoms and solids in exactly the same footing in this paper. Yet in the 50 years since then, we forgot that they are, were treated on the same footing. And largely the solid state work has gone off to look at technology, 
fine machining and things like that, all very important things. And the gas phase work has gone off to develop our harmonic generation at a second pulses and all great things too. But they've gone in completely separated, in completely different ways. I think it's natural to ask, is recollision important in the solids? In, this, in the spirit of Kellich, you would expect it to be. So we are, in my laboratory, I was going to put it in, but I felt there was no time. We are applying in situ measurements to show that high harmonics from solids and gases are both recollision based. And once we accept this, then the band structure or the difference in band structure between the conduction and valence band on which the recollision is, is done is measured in a single shot measurement. So I think I wanted to illustrate one case in which we are applying this to a field we don't know about and trying to use it. So to end with, Gerard, um, I agree with you. Ultra high intensity physics, I think, will take the lead in ultra to high time resolution measurements. I really do. I, I always have, I, so I completely accept that view. And I say you have an open invitation to visit Ottawa anytime to discuss this further and see how far we can develop it. So I think it's a great, great idea and happy birthday and I'm really <laughs> pleased to be here. It's a great occasion. Good, well, thank you. I accept <laughs> that invitation. <laughs> Open now, but I haven't used it like two weeks ago. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, so we, we continue on the uh, at a second vein with uh, Professor Ursula Keller from ETH Zurich, who's also uh, uh, we're very happy to have her here. Uh, Going to work. Is that a, the microphone? Microphone. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Up. And so should we talk about that a second on the vision for a minute? Mm. Well, I hope I didn't blow the surprise. Okay. Good. Okay. So, um, good. Hello. So, anyway, um, I have some picture with me and Gerard in one picture. So this is in one conference in Europe and there you can actually do it in a medieval castle. Nice setting. So here is Gerard, here is me. And yes, I'm not a student from Gerard and some people may even ask, what are you doing here? <laughs> because this is a justified question for the old timers. I'm also not a content everything obviously but actually my professor uh, I mean I'm in this first generation of a professor with the first generation of students from Geraldine Rue and really you know well, during my PhD time <laughs> 85 to 89 I was actually part of the enemy camp <laughs> which you know as you know that was fierce competition with very young professors all very ambitious and and it propagates into the students, you know, who, 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 you know, obviously these people are kind of really strange, right? So, because I was actually a graduate student with Professor Dave Bloom at Stanford University, who was equally excited about the electro-optic sampling as Gerard Mourou was, and I think actually Gerard was a little bit earlier, but uh, Dave thought he had a little bit better idea, whatever. <laughs> and after all, you know, the Stanford people are much smarter anyway. So, so this was basically how I grew up. I got to know Gerard Mourou and the rest of all the PhD students because that's, we were overlapping on partially on this line. So, 
Then I became a summer student with Dave Austin, which was the third enemy camping on this thing because the Austin switch and the electro-optic thing. So there I was, you know, going, you know, being just a naive student going between all these kind of areas. And you know what happened? I actually, that's where I basically met Janis Waldmanis. And this is where we, the first time, crossed all borders, right? We very peacefully, very peacefully worked together. Uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just wait, just wait. <laughs> so where we crossed in all the borders, and of course, we were peacefully happy ever after. And, you know, and Yanis was a little bit concerned having me as a summer student in his lab because, you know, um, being a woman, you know, they never tighten up the screws too deep. So, so, he, so what I've learned from Yanis, you know, he told me, make sure you tighten the screws really, uh, really tight, right? <laughs> and, you know, I'm a physicist, you know, you can tighten screws without muscles, right? So, so my revenge was that I tightened the screws so much that he never got them off anymore. <laughs> After I left. No, 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 later, later, yes, now it's my turn, my turn. <laughs> you have to listen to me. Ah, up, 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 up. <laughs> later. <laughs> you know, because we actually became more peaceful. So 1992, actually, Buru offered a job, me and Kurt, right? Because we were a dual career couple, and but my husband was interested in starting a company. But then Switzerland made this incredible offer to me, and I moved back to Europe because Switzerland gave me, you know, being 33 years old, a 10-year professor position, and 1.5 million Swiss francs starting money which I thought was infinite amount of money. And then my husband said, you know, if you get all this stuff, I'll come along to Europe and start a company in Switzerland. And so, and actually Muru followed us anyway later on, so. <laughs> <laughs> and now, and, uh, and now Muru has been a great supporter for ultrafast science in Europe. He has been reviewing some of my proposals and he is for sure never the one who says, oh, do you're asking too much money for your science, right? <laughs> Because, I mean, there are some reviewers who do that to you, right, which you really don't like. Or other reviewers who tell you, oh, this is impossible. And then you also know, oh, that was in Gerard Rumo, who, who reviewed that one. So in any case, we are very grateful for your influence in Europe. And, you know, because we have a lot of quantum optics competition for the money. So anyway, so this is my introduction. And this is why I'm here. So for some of the old timers, Muru students. Now, um, uh, the stuff I'm gonna talk about is basically half of my group is now doing ultra second science. And, um, and you know, the key people who are involved in what I'm talking about are shown here, and I'm not gonna read every single name of it. And, you know, I uh, attended a very nice workshop um, uh, last year where basically um, Steve Leone organized this workshop the question was, what will it take to observe processes in real time in the ultra second domain? And to, that you understand what we are, for what actually was talking about, because we're all looking back very happily to the femtosecond domain, you know, where you could do pump and probe, right? This classical thing where you use the delta pulse, right? Where the femtosecond was considered the delta pulse, and you looked at dynamics th that were much longer than the pulses. And so that you could do this nice um, pump and probe, you know, here shown with a balloon, you can think of a molecule, of a semiconductor and so on, whatever your favorite pick. You know, here is the pump is the bullet and the balloon is the, and in the flash photography is the probe to see how the balloon is exploding. So this was where the easy way how you actually can make a movie, right? So in the nanosecond domain, we, we really haven't achieved that yet. And what is the, the problem in, in that is really that we are, um, we are working with nanotube pulses at a kilohertz. What does this mean? 
So what we are ta um, typically having is an ultra-fast tire shaft dilator based on CPA, without CPA we wouldn't have. And then we have an incredibly inefficient process to go to high harmonics to the upper second of 20 minus six. So we're starting off typically with, mm, with, uh, with a kilohertz and you know, we can then produce, if we are good at it, a nano joule pulse at a kilohertz with about 100 ultra second pulses. So when you compare that to the femtosecond domain, you know, where most of us have been for a long time, we had nano joule pulses of 100 megahertz, which means 100 milliwatt of average power, right? This is signal to noise right there. Ultra second domain, we have nano joule pulses at a kilohertz, it's a microwatt. So we have five orders of magnitude lower uh, average photon flux, which basically limits your uh, signal to noise. And so either you, you, know, you substantially beef up these pulses in, in the lower repetition rate, which normally when you wanna do any surface science experiment, you, you have way too much energy, you blow up the whole thing. And anything that you wanna look at that is actually interesting in physics is, is, is blown into pieces. And so there is a significant amount of work going on to push these amplifiers, you know, no, this is pulse energy and repetition rate. So normally the amplifiers have been at one kilohertz and in this millijoule regime. And the amplifier is now pushing into the megahertz regime. And the oscillators, which have been typically in the 100 megahertz regime and in the nanojoule pulse energy are pushing up. What does this mean? You know, average power is pulse energy times repetition rate you get average power. So we are talking now systems where we have average power of several hundred watt, a kilowatt. And this is clear where high shaft dial is not gonna do it. And these are now all based on dial pump solid state laser, typically a terbium doped solid state laser. We can actually now even produce uh, laser oscillators with several hundred watt of output power in the femtosecond domain, which is simply amazing. I mean, if you would have asked people 20 years ago that this is possible. It's amazing. There is fiber, slab, uh, thin disk laser. I mean, the technology is really pushing. And what makes it actually more reliable is that there is also the micro machining, um, uh, basically in dust industry, which is also asking for these lasers. And so there is hope that we actually get some reliable lasers into our laser lab and not having always non-working lasers in our laser lab, <laughs> you know the pump lasers. So meanwhile, before, before we can do this ultra second pump and ultra second probe, we end up doing uh, ultra second pulses and normally femtosecond probe or whatever combinations of it. So you very often have this femtosecond pulse around and you wanna get ultra second time resolution. And people have been extremely creative. I mean, it was just amazing, sometimes hard to, uh, to keep up with all the new technologies, how you can measure after seconds. And actually some of the inventions we could have done way, way earlier, but people just weren't thinking along those lines. I mean, I will show you on the after clock, the after clock we could have done a long time ago, but we just weren't thinking along those lines. So, you know, I will discuss three techniques that we are using to really do after second measurement. And I'll show you some real numbers, which actually slowly but surely we, we can believe in. And when you look, so this is after second energy streaking, and this is, for example, measurement. I mean, anybody who is, has done stuff like this, this is the quality of data that we get nowadays. It's really nice. The after clock and after second interferometer, the rapid technique, and we are looking at very fundamental questions. I mean, we are now doing things which when you were a student, you ask yourself when you learn quantum mechanics, how long does this take? And people tell you, we, we, you, know, you can't ask this question, we don't know this question. And now we are back and can actually address these questions and even get some measurements. So we wanna know how long does it take for light to remove an electron from an atom, from a molecule, from a surface, right? And there are normally in this field, you distinguish between these different uh, ways of removing an electron with light. Either if your photon energy is much less than the ionization potential, then you go into this multi-photon ionization. Or if your, uh, your IR infrared photon is very strong, you can do this tunnel ionization. Or if your photon energy is larger, 
uh, then the ionization potential, you know, in helium is 24 EV, neon and so on. Uh, then you can actually do it with a single photon. And in all questions is, how long does it take? And somehow there must be a connection between the time it takes to take one photon absorbs to n photons, and something there must be a scaling. And when you ask theoreticians today, you get any answers you can think of, from zero to whatever, right? So we are now want to measure this. So the three techniques that are being used to address these questions are these after second after sec uh, streaking. This was actually the first time after second time resolution was obtained in Ferenc Krause's group in Munich. Then we uh, uh, invented this auto uh, clock technique, which we use for this um, multi photon ionization, tunnel ionization. And then the after second interferometry, the rabbit, was invented in, in France, but for the pulse characterization. But then for the ionization delay and single photon ionization was actually done in Anne-Louis' group um, uh, for the first time. And the question is then, when we, when we take all these techniques, um, do we, in all cases, actually measure at the same time? So is it actually, uh, does it depend? Because when, when you look at time measurements, tend to get theoreticians going all emotional, because time is not an operator uh, in quantum mechanics. So you have to be very careful. What are your observables? And you know, why can you measure what you measure? What is this Heisenberg uncertainty principle and so on? And uh, I'll ask you then a question which we can discuss again at dinner uh, if you figure it out. So, so the first time these me measurements were done uh, in the single photon ionizations, there were two results on neon where they looked at the time delay between uh, a transition out of a 2P and a 2S state. There was a time difference of 20 optoseconds. Then the interferometric measurement in argon from 3p to 3s state was 110 optoseconds. And, and you couldn't really compare these two because there were two different targets. Then for the tunnel ionization, we actually um, could do it absolute. We had a time zero calibration where you don't have this one here. And that was extremely fast. So how does this all fit together? So let me first explain the auto clock technique and then I'll go into the other thing. So the auto clock in principle we could have done a long time ago, as I said, but you know, we just weren't thinking along it. And even um, when we came up with this technique, it was actually an experiment that didn't work. And after we understood it, we came up with this idea. Even after all this linear streaking, it's actually sometimes amazing how, how these things evolve. So, um, so basically the after clock um, the measures time the way we actually normally measure time. You know, you have uh, on, a, on a clock, you have the hour hand, the minute hand, the second hand, and the faster this hand is going in a circle, the more accurate is the measurement of time, right? And so if you take a closed to circle of polarized light, the electric field vector is rotating in one optical cycle around uh, in this uh, full turn. So at 800 nanometer, a full turn is 2.7 femtoseconds. So you have one revolution per about one fem uh, femtosecond. So you have an extremely uh, accurate measurement in time. And then the question is just how can you use this clock to actually make a measurement? And so for the tunnel ionization, this is actually very simple because if you take a, a not a perfectly circularized pulse, but a little bit of an electrical, so, uh, and because the tunnel ionization is extremely nonlinear, the maximum of your electrical field is along the elliptical axis. And so the time zero, which is the most probable tunnel ionization induced is actually along this axis. So you only, uh, time zero is a measurement of a polarization, which is an independent measurement. And then at the end of the pulse, you measure the electron momentum vector. And with, uh, in a, in after the pulse, without any Kuno interaction, the electrons actually come out exactly 90 degrees with regards to time zero, if you have no tunneling delay. 
if you, you then have to take into account the Coulomb interaction, which in helium mapping you can do absolute, it's a closed form solution of the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And then if you still have an offset, which your most probable counts, so these are counts of electrons coming, and because you're looking at the most probable trajectory, you look at the peak surge, even the distribution is longer, uh, you can then determine the angle with the most probable electron, which corresponds to this uh, most starting point. And this angle offset then gives you the tunneling time when you correct it for the Coulomb uh, correction, which you can do uh, correctly. And when you do that, you can get these measurements. So this is basically the tunnel ionization in helium over an intensity range, which is uh, basically, you know, this electrical field, light field, is bending the Coulomb potential and you're producing um, tunnel barrier. So with this intensities here, which are typically used in this field, uh, you change the barrier width of this um, barrier, which you can approximate like a triangular barrier, uh, between a little bit more than 10 atomic, this is not arbitrary units, it's atomic units. That's also something you have to get used to it. So a little bit more than seven atomic units, so one atomic unit is 0.5 angstrom, to 20 atomic units. So it's a pretty long tunnel barrier. When you look at how long it takes for the electron to go through it, it ranges between 20 attoseconds and about you know, 70, 80 after second. And look at this is after second, not femtosecond anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then some people always say, oh, you know, the electrons are uh, superluminal. You know, this would be the speed of light. But if you compare it to all the other tunnel theory, because tunneling time has been a field for 80 years, but nobody ever has measured electron tunneling time. You know, there is, for example, the Pollack-Miller, the critical Landauer tunneling time is here, right? It's in the 700 attosecond down here, it's depending, you know, the stronger the field, the smaller is the tunnel barrier, the faster it goes. And the Keldish time is very similar to the critical Landauer. Then here is the eisenbutz wigner and this is our data, right? So you can actually say, no, this is a clear difference, right? And if you then blow up the scale, you can see that our data is actually very uh, close to the so-called Larmor tunneling time. And you can actually explain our data also with the Feynman path integral, which was done in, uh, by Alexandra Lanzmann, calculating for this one. And I think it is very interesting that actually the Larmor time is the one that we measure with the afterclock. Because the Larmor time is this uh, Gedanken experiment where you say, that you have a magnetic field in the tunnel barrier and only in the tunnel barrier. And if you have an electron with a spin and you send it through this tunnel barrier, then as soon as the magnetic field is seen, the spin starts precess. And so by measuring the angle uh, of the precession of the spin of the electron, you then get a tunneling time, right? And this is, of course, a theoretical concept and can be calculated theoretically. You can never do an experiment like this, but it is the same as what we measure with the afterclock, which is also measuring the time like this, which I think is dumb. <laughs> so, and then we measured also, you know, how, how long does it take in double ionization when the second electron comes out? Does it come out sequentially? Does it come out? This is a top topic in the field. And of course, we found out even in circular polarized light, it come, the second one comes earlier than what you would have predicted with sequential tunnel ionization. And you have actually a, a, a different probability of two electrons going into the same direction than in the opposite direction. So if it would be totally independent, the two electron would go, the ratio of the two would be one, but we don't see just one, right? It's, uh, there is an oscillation. So let me go to the single photon ionization. So the single photon ionization, we haven't done yet with the outer clock. This is something which we're gonna do uh, next. But first we started off with the energy sweeping and the rabbit because we wanted to connect to the other two measurements and, and uh, at the same time. So here we are asking, right? Time zero, T naught, comes your short after second pulse and is single photon ionizing 
target A and target B. How long does it take for these electrons to come out? Because now the timing is not, you don't have an absolute reference in the techniques, the streaking and the rapid. You need to have a reference. So you need to do a measurement of two atoms. Like in the original one, they just took a, a, a transition from two levels. But what we are showing here now is actually taking the ionization of two elements and looking at the difference between the ionization. So I can ask, you know, is the electron from argon coming sooner than the one from neon or from helium or H2? So what is your guess? And I could do a um, thing and we would get a random distribution. You know, um, you know, we actually look at this and of course want to know, does it actually depend on how I measure it? So for this, we uh, used the um, so-called uh, Coltrane's, uh, which we learned how to uh, use from uh, Dörner from Frankfurt, which is very close. And it's, a, it's actually coming from the nuclear physics, a nice detector, which is now being more and more adapted to the ultra fast laser physics is basically you have your gas target here and you come in with your laser pulse and with your attosecond pulse train or pul short pulse and you ionize uh, the gas in here and you then measure the ion and the electron in coincidence. So you then know when you measure the electron here to what ion it is, from what ion it comes from because it's all done in coincidence. So when we, uh, so we built this whole attosecond front end to get attosecond pulses into this culture. So we were the first ones to succeed in doing this because it's actually not so trivial. And we actually succeeded because we built a really good culture. Because when, when we uh, transferred the technology back to Switzerland, we had people from the Swiss machine shop helping us. And they always asked uh, uh, the, the Germans, you know, but you know, you could do it like this. And then they said, yeah, but would cost a lot of money. And then they said, it doesn't matter, you know? And so we made a really big Coltrane's and a very good Coltrane's. And because of that, we actually succeeded doing it because it's not so trivial to do it. So this is normally what you would see. These are electron energy as a function of the delay. Bet uh, this is in a rapid, so it's an attosecond pulse train between the attosecond pulse train and the electron. And you know, if you have argon and neon, these electrons, it's a big mess. Right? There is nothing, you know, I don't have the time to explain rapid to you, but you know, by then doing this coincidence, you get real clean rapid traces and out of these rapid traces, you then uh, get the delay. And so what we found out without going into details is basically the, arg uh, the neon electron comes earlier than the argon neon and it, the delay at, at basically at the, uh, I did that at uh, 34 uh, EV, is, um, is 75 attoseconds. And then if you actually repeat this measurement and also do it in comparison, for example, to helium, then you at 34, you know, this is for example, the time delay as a function of energy from the uh, photon that is ionizing. Now look at, for example, uh, at about 34 EV. This is data, the blue one is the one done in my lab and then the red one is actually simultaneously done by Anne Lillier with a different setup in a different lab and they, their data is here. The streaking, which is another one, the theory is down here, we are up here. But when you take this one in comparison and then you compare it also to helium, you know the time difference between neon and helium, this is red again is, our, is the Lund result and blue is our result independent from each other. The theory this time is fitting ours, which is funny. So if we go to the 34 EV range, you know, we have basically um, the helium electron comes about 15 attoseconds earlier than the neon electron and then the argon neon electron. Kind of interesting, right? Nice. And you know, and then you can keep doing. So we did it also with H2 with the molecule. And if you look at the molecule, you can also reference it to two gases and actually it all fits together. So when we then reference the ionization of the H2 to the argon, we see that the ele H2 electron comes about 50 attosecond earlier uh, than the argon and actually about 25 attosecond later from neon and it all fits together. 
the signal. So we are actually really at the point where we do optosecond science and pulling out numbers in the optosecond domain, which is pretty impressive, right? So um, with this, uh, you know, the question is of course, what next? I mean, we keep doing more measurements because, you know, we still have a problem that the streaking results, which I haven't really showed you yet, they are not agreeing with this measurement. They are all over the place. And there might be also a reason that, the, that basically uh, when you do the IR streaking, maybe the IR field is simply too strong because in rapid, the IR streaking is actually a perturbation. It's a much lower intensity, whereas in the streaking, you need to do it longer. So this is something we need to investigate. And then, of course, I want to also do the whole thing with the optoclock because you can also do this with single photon ionization. You just lower your IR intensity, still use it as a time reference, but this time you ionize not with um, um, a tunnel ionization, but with a single photon and also use two, uh, two, um, um, two species because you don't have then the time zero calibration anymore as you have it with the tunnel ionization. And then we see if we actually measure the same as the rapid and you know, there, you know, I would say we're probably not gonna measure the same. Because you know, for those people who have any idea, the rapid is measuring actually the weakener phase delay and the optoclock clock might look different here. And that's a something, a really cool conversation which normally gets every single physicist going. You can fill up whole evenings in the emotional outburst of theoretical physicists. So this is really fun. I can say, I mean, I've been now in optosecond science and we're now really producing uh, real numbers, real physics discussion, and it has been a lot of fun. And with this, thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Shifting now a little bit away from attoseconds to the development of uh, petawatt and zettawatt science. And our next speaker will be Chris Barty from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And he will give us a perspective on the uh, development of CPA lasers uh, around the world. So this is a talk about how much trouble Gerard has been causing for the whole ultra high intensity laser world. Okay? Because we all know that Gerard causes lots of trouble for lots of different people. And after all, you know, being the chief technology officer of the CTO, which actually is the chief troublemaking officer at the lab, I like uh, people who cause trouble. Um, so I'm going to talk about CPA on a grand scale. This will be a little bit of a historical overview and hopefully it'll lay the groundwork for some of the high intensity activities are gonna come uh, forward. Um, we all know this kind of plot that sits out here. We also know that QOS holds the record at 10 to the 22 watts per square centimeter. I show this plot because you know basically every decade that we go up in this plot, new things happen. And that's been the, the motivation for this field for a very long time. Sometimes we have predictions about what's gonna happen. Sometimes we're surprised by what happens. Um, and at uh, the next frontier or the next decade, which is 10 to the 23, there are many things that might happen. Uh, 10 to the 23, for instance, could be reached if you had a diffraction limited petawatt laser and you focused it to a one micron spot. So imagine a, a 15 tenths a second, 15 joule laser into a one micron spot. The energy density, in fact, the things that I like on this plot are the top and the bottom. The energy density that you create there is something like 3.3 .3 times 10 to the 12 joules per cubic centimeter. So if I just use Einstein and I go energy to mass, I'm, or uh, I'm, I have real mass in my photons, but I also have the equivalent energy density of things at a very high uh, uh, power. You know, this is 600 tons of TNT per cubic centimeter is the energy density. 
And coming from a weapons lab, I kind of like numbers like that, right? And then, of course, the one at the bottom is one where I think is really the fun that's going to start happening in the relativistic optics and non and uh, ultra relativistic optics. You know, at 10 to the 23 watts per square centimeter, you the virtual positrons and electrons in the vacuum uh, will now be your nonlinear media, right? You won't be just playing with regular old electrons. You'll be playing with these virtual positrons and electrons. And you could, in principle, focus 10 to the 23 into nothing and have the reaction, the chi-3 reaction of the virtual positrons and electrons give you 50 to 100 blue photons out of nothing if I put that red laser light in. And that's kind of neat uh, to, to think about that happening. And of course, the further up you go, the more that we're going to be playing with the vacuum and starting to do real interesting physics. Personally, I think we're also going to be having to learn how to do really good vacuum physics because at that kind of intensity, you will be ionizing many things before you get to uh, the focus even with a very good vacuum. So there is a community of people of which Gerard, this is the one rare photo where Gerard's not in the front row. <laughs> 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 um, but the community of people which Gerard uh, promoted and uh, got them all wound up about this subject in the 80s and 90s got together at the end of the, of the 90s and basically realized that the lasers were getting big that we were extending this chirp pulse amplification idea to a big scale, and that the laser facilities that were going to happen next might be, or that there would be the case that laser facilities were going to uh, uh, come about that were bigger than a single PI. And so the community got together and started talking about you know, what would happen with respect to uh, the next generation of facilities. And so there was this Global Science Forum workshop. Global Science Forum is a, a mechanism set up by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development for different communities of scientists to get together and discuss. OECD, by the way, normally deals with issues like water rights between countries and things, but they have this, this set up to do this kind of arrangement. So we all met in Kyoto, uh, well actually in Kizu, Japan, back in uh, 2001, and had a discussion about this, and that led to uh, a further A further proposal to stand up a coordinating committee on compact, high-intensity short pulse lasers. Um, that coordinating committee met uh, several times. The meeting at Livermore uh, decided to join the communities of the very short duration with the very high-energy short pulse lasers together. Um, and then we decided to go and approach the IUPAT, that's the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics, the, the group that decides what a meter is and say, we would like to start uh, a working group called the International Committee on Ultra High Intensity Lasers. Um, that working group was meant to be patterned after the ICSA, International Committee on Future Accelerators Working Group, which is the body of people who get together and, and contemplate what the next generation accelerator capability is going to be. So you think about what's beyond LHC, they're the group that we go to. So there was this proposal that was made to IUPAP uh, in October of 2003, and then Gerard's now in the front row. <laughs> and actually, he was the first chair of ICTUAL, of this committee. Uh, that's very appropriate that he should be there. Um, we had our kickoff meeting in 2004. The ICTUAL, uh, if you want to learn more, has a nice web page. I'll just point out a couple of things. One of the things that we try and do is promote unity and coherence in the field by convening conferences and workshops dedicated to ultra-high intensity lasers. We've been holding a biennial meeting since 2004. The first one was in Lake Tahoe. The next one was in Cassis in, in France, a very nice place. Next one was in Tong Lee in China, followed by Watson's Glen in uh, New York, and then uh, the Black Sea in Romania. And next, uh, this coming October, we will be in Goa. Now, I guess you can see a theme here. We all like to be around the water. We like to be around the water, especially Gerard likes to be around the water, <laughs> right? and his wife, both like to swim everywhere. I'm sorry I didn't have a photo from Romania, but both of them went swimming in Romania as well. Right? I don't think anybody went swimming in Tongli, though. So, yeah. Um, and then, of course, the other thing we try and do is we try and coordinate and help the coordination between the various laboratories around the world so that if one facility has uh, technology that's of use to 